All right, everyone is joining in. So let's get started. I always like to kick it off with saying that the art doctor is in. All right, uh, next slide, Gwen. Okay, so welcome to the first conservation program of 2021 here at the museum. I'm Laura Hoffman, the program manager of the Lunder Conservation Center at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. We sometimes say SAM for short. For those of you that have joined us before, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, this is a monthly online discussion guided by your questions. Next slide. So if you've participated in 2020, you all know that my brief housekeeping kicks us off before we really get into the discussion. So as I mentioned, rather than this be a set presentation, this program is a dialogue between you, the audience, and our conservator du jour. So since your cameras and mics are off, please submit your questions through our Q&A feature. I'll be your host and your moderator, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the 45 minutes. We are recording this program so that it will be available in our museum video section of the website. I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. Note that only the panelists audio and camera will show up in this recording. We also have closed captioning today. So if you wanna take advantage of this, please hit the CC option at the bottom of the page. Also, please keep your internet browser open because at the end of the program, a survey will come up and it is always great for us to get all of your feedback as we're planning future programs. Our wonderful intern Armando Rivera is working behind the scenes in case you have any technical questions. So feel free to use the chat box if you have any issues and he will respond to you. Next slide. So before we dig in, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here in Washington, DC the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands the museum is gathered, and the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing Sam's historic building. We would also like to deeply thank the museum's essential and frontline workers who have been keeping the collection, people, and museum safe throughout the pandemic. They're the backbone of this museum, and we greatly appreciate their hard work. Next slide. So if you haven't been here before, uh, I wanted to show you a glimpse into the Lunder Conservation Center. It is the first visible art conservation lab that is on permanent display here at the museum. And so that means that my job, I get to offer programs both in person and now online. So tonight I am delighted to be joined by paintings conservator Gwen Manthe. For this Converse with a Conservator, we thought we would mix it up just a little bit and have it be a chance for you all to ask what your burning questions are on how to care for your paintings. So you might be an artist yourself or a home collector, maybe a, even a professional, but we wanna know, what do you wanna know about how to care for your paintings? So before we get into that, it's always helpful to know a little bit about our, our conservators. So Gwen, will you start off and let us know how you became a paintings conservator here at SAM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have been at SAM um, since 2017. I joined the staff at the Lunder Conservation Center after um, graduating. Uh, let me roll back a little bit further. Um, a fun question to always ask conservators is their origin story. You know, how did you find out about conservation? Because it isn't typically a well-known field. Um, I was pretty lucky. I learned about conservation really early on when I was probably 11 years old. I got a job cleaning houses um, to basically earn money for babysitters club books, um, something that's a little, a little hysterical, but it was the 90s. Um, and I couldn't get any babysitting jobs. I, those were sort of already taken in the neighborhood and no one was gonna let a, an 11 year old girl mow their lawn. Um, but so, I got a job with a, with, a, with a neighbor, basically dusting and vacuuming her house. And my grandmother found out about this and gave me the National Geographic um, copy, I think it's August 1989, on the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel. I said, look what other people clean. How amazing is this to care for artwork and for cultural heritage? Well, 
I sort of forgot about it being 11 years old until I was about 16. And I thought again, you know, high school surveys, working in the arts was something that was always recommended to me, although I had some proclivity for sciences. And I got in touch with a conservator at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it was like when email first started and asked them about asked him about his training. And he told me that it was a graduate degree. And so, you know, I promptly forgot it again until I was in my early 20s. And this is not, I was not going to college right after high school. I decided to go ahead and work and figure out what I wanted to do with myself. And I remembered about this one field, conservation. And I had also started to take some classes at a local community college, just some beginning painting classes and an art history class. And my life drawing instructor said, you know, work with the arts. This is something that you definitely love. And I knew I didn't want to be an artist. Um, so remember, remembered about this tiny field of art conservation. And so researched in order to get my initial bachelor's degree. Um, I actually went to the only university that where you could sort of get primed for that grad degree. I knew it was, again, a master's degree that I would have to shoot for. So I went to the University of Delaware and took care of all of those essential required classes to apply for um, one of the grad programs. And there were only a couple in the United States at that point. And then actually returned to the University of Delaware for the master's program. And in between, I took some time to buy a house in Houston and get some more pre-program experience and work with some really fantastic people. And from grad school, I did my third year fellowship at the Walters Art Museum, continued with a post-grad fellowship went on to the Chrysler Museum of Art for two years as their National Endowment of the Humanities Fellow, got a position as associate, sorry, assistant paintings conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where I focused on the treatment of a very large painting on that where I treated in public view. They have a, a conservation um, in action space. And it literally was a closed in gallery, essentially a fishbowl I was working on a 19 foot tall altarpiece by Benjamin West. And Throughout all of my postgrad experiences, um, there was such a huge aspect of public outreach. And I actually found a note um, not that long ago that I shared with you, Laura, about touring the Lender Center in 2009 and sort of like dreaming big dreams of how great would it be to work here. And lo and behold, 2017 rolls around and I had the opportunity to take on a short-term contract and then officially applied for and got the position as Paintings Conservator. And I've been delighted to work with you since that point. Of so course, that's I, I paid you for that last <laughs> Um Well, that is a wonderful origin story. People are already sending feedback. They really enjoyed it. Thank also, you. We are getting a ton of questions. So <laughs> Great. I know, I'm so glad. look, I know you have some things, but I, I we need to get into this yeah. because I'm seeing quite a bit. And I'm also seeing some um, ones, so I might lump a few of them together because I'm already noticing we have a couple ones that are specifically asking about um, paintings that people mm -hmm. have that have been in places with a lot of cigarette smoke. Ah, uh, yes. And yeah. so they want to know about safely cleaning it mm -hmm. um, and or kind of thinking about it long term. Yeah. So I'm, I, as a disclaimer, I would not recommend to any owner of um, paintings to go about cleaning the works themselves. The most I would like to recommend to people to do, you know, in addition to like that desire to care for them, I mean, that's one of the most important things that you can do um, is dusting the artwork. That's that's one thing I feel the most confident in recommending, you know, almost every skill set can dust their artwork. You just want to use a very soft brush um, this is a goat hair hake brush, which you can buy at most of your online real retailers or even some fine art supply stores. And before you dust though, you want to examine the painting to make sure that there are no areas of flaking paint. And I would recommend, you know, using um, some magnifying devices. Uh, perhaps you have a magnifying um, a lens um, and a strong flashlight and just go over the surface of the painting quickly to make sure that, not quickly, carefully, um, but you want to do this before you dust the work at all, um, because um, I would hate to say you can dust the artwork, but if there's chipping and, and lifting paint, the possibility is that, you know, you can accidentally cause parts of these paint flakes to come off. Um, 
I have treated a number of paintings that had a pretty thick layer of cigarette smoke on them. And why I don't recommend, you know, I'm not going to provide a solution um, or tell somebody to clean this painting. It's because artists didn't always work in one medium. They could have gone in later with something like an acrylic or even um, a water soluble oil. These are things that are available at the mark in, in fine art stores or even watercolors. And the solutions that you would use to remove the cigarette smoke or the tobacco grime, cigarettes, <laughs> the tobacco grime, um, you, you can actually dissolve some of those original layers. Um, even acrylic paintings are susceptible to even cleaning with um, water, aqueous solution. So conservatives typically go through and test very carefully different pigments, different areas to make sure that you're not going to lose any of that color, any of that pigment. Um, so you can go to um, the AIC's Find a Conservator website and actually look for a conservator who specializes in paintings in your area. You, you'll put in your zip code and you'll look into an area as close to, like I think it's five miles away up to a hundred miles away. Um, I would also get in touch with your local museum, your fine arts museum, because they might happen to have knowledge of conservators in the area. They should give you a couple of them. And at that point, you want to do best practices as, you, as if you're hiring any specialist, any plumber um, or an electrician, ask for reviews, ask about their education. Um, the AIC has a, a professional associate status. So after a conservator has been trained and um, sh demonstrates the experience of um, a qualified conservator, continuing education, following ethical standards, documentation. You can you can you can get um, recommendations for those conservators, but then you also want to talk with a conservator and see who best fits with you, who who will explain what it is they're seeing in the artwork, and detail how they are going to treat for that artwork. And it might be remedial, and it could be something that's very interventive, because in addition to tobacco grime, there could be other issues such as flaking paint. And I just want to let you know, I, I did put the link in the chat for the American Institute for Conservation's Find a Conservator tool um, online. I put that in the chat now. One thing that's come out in, in other programs is the chat does go away at the end. So if you're interested in this link, click on it now and it'll save on your internet browser for after the program. Because I know you're going to reference it a lot. I know we use that we talk about it for people who ask us. It's a really amazing resource. Mm -hmm. So another question, because you mentioned dusting and, and that has come up quite a bit as well, is thinking about dusting paintings. A, a couple of people have asked, what if there's no glass? You know, what if it is just the actual canvas? So yeah. tell us a little bit on your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share a little bit just so I can, I have a bunch of props, so I want to be able to pull them up. Um, we prepared very thoroughly for you. Um, how do I, I'm just going to exit. <laughs> I think that's it. I've, I've stopped screen share now. Yep, you're good. Okay, we, we're Excellent. just seeing you. Okay, so the, the paintings in the museum, not everything is behind glass. That is where we're also just dusting with a soft brush, maybe something a little bit bigger than this. Um, you know, first we're going to go through and we're going to expect everything with um, some optimizers and a strong flashlight. So I want to just show you the optimizers that we regularly use and some options for you at home. Um, so these are basically jewelers loops that, you know, you can wear on your hand. You can get different strengths um, to magnify what it is you're seeing. These are also very handy. And I know, Laura, that you're a fan of these very small glasses and you can even get them with a little light. I found these on a major online retailer and they're sort of geared towards putting in false eyelashes and they're quite economical. So that is an option for you to use as well. Um, so Great to get things <laughs> dual purpose. Um, while you're showing us with the mm -hmm. uh, one question that came up, can you show and say the brush again that you had yeah. mentioned so we can see it larger? I just actually dropped it, but I have another brush. <laughs> of course, on I have another brush on my uh, uh, on hand, and so this is yet another goat hair brush. Um, they don't have to be goat hair, um, but you can actually even use a soft makeup brush. Um, you want to get a brand new, some one of those big blush brushes. But I would also recommend taping up that metal ferrule, and I have a small brush here to show you what a ferrule is. So this is just a small brush on hand. This is the ferrule. 
And you want to make sure that you cover this with, you know, you can cover it with a little bit of blue tape because you want to be sure that the metal doesn't actually scratch the surface. And obviously you would get something a bit bigger than this and longer bristles. I mentioned makeup brushes because, you know, these are designed to be nice and soft and they're not gonna scratch you as you're using them. Um, make sure it's brand new and try to clean it regularly. Um, we got a little distracted there. No, it, so it sounds like- yeah. Oh, hey. The that's what it is. Well, it sounds like the things to look for for brushes, because there mm -hmm. are so many ones is you want them to be soft, right? Really soft mm -hmm. for, and if possible, um, animal made as opposed to synthetic. Although if so, it should be a very soft one. Yeah, you can get some soft nylon, but the goat hair tends to be pretty soft, very consistently. And you want it to be new. So yes, clean. Don't, yes. if you buy a makeup brush, this is not a dual purpose one. You should not use it on your face. You will have that. It will not work out well for your painting and that you should tape up so that no metal scratches. Those are kind of the three biggies. Yes. And yes. you can get them, as you said, at any art supply store online, or even if you're doing like your favorite makeup company, though, those actually might be more expensive. Yeah, they would. Um, you can get a small hake brush like this for less than $10, um, depending on your area. And, um, the one thing is though, the lower quality brushes, the bristles will come out. Um, so you are paying for a better brush when it's slightly more expensive, these aren't gonna come out. But when you're only dry brushing, they don't come off as much, but you can always go through and just give it um, a little grab. And so I, I pulled out a little hair there for instance, just to sort of prime it. That way you're not leaving little bristles on your paintings. Okay, so we have so many, this is amazing. Yeah, so we, that's why as, I as I thought, no, we just have so many questions with this. Um, uh, so we've kind of talked a little bit about dusting and we can ask more. Uh, one quick, quick question is how often would you do dusting for paintings at home? Yeah, so we dust pretty regularly at the museum and you know, because we have, we have visitors that come through for the sole purpose of looking at the artwork and you know, people equate dust. Um, but also if you're living in a home, you know, you have pets, you like to have the windows open, there are pollen that's com that comes in and depends on if you have carpet or not, and how regularly you clean your home as well. Um, I recommend doing it, you know, you can make it seasonal um, once, you know, as the season cha seasons change um, that you can dust. And actually I would keep a little record book. And so I'm going to just slide in there. Um, a bit that you can do for your own housekeeping and for your own record. So as you're noticing as a work changes and similarly, when you first get an artwork or you're thinking about how does it change, um, you can also buy yourself a little color checker. Um, I got again this, uh, again, another little on, on major online retailer. When you first get your artwork, try to take a high resolution photograph with a color checker in there and make sure it's um, listed as your home with your homeowner's insurance as fine art. So if you are a collector and you're serious about building your collection, your homeowner's insurance doesn't necessarily um, protect artworks. I think it's a thousand dollars, I think, or some was the limit when it comes to fine art. So it needs to be registered separately. And so take a picture of it with a color checker and you can file it in your, um, your backup drive, your homeowner's documents as well. Um, but refer to that, you know, as the years go by, it could be 10 years later where you take a photograph and you are comparing them and you might notice with that color checker in there, you've got a calibration to see if there has been any darkening, any change. Right, well, this is, I mean, I personally never thought about home, my insurance policy. So I'm gonna, I have some homework for myself to do after this. Um, another question I'm seeing a lot uh, different, mm -hmm. but the same theme is about sunlight, um, yes. direct sunlight. We've got questions about northern sunlight, southern sunlight. What are your thoughts on sun exposure mm -hmm. and I guess broader light exposure on paintings? Yes, um, so sunlight, as we know, sunlight does a lot. It, 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 it catalyzes a lot of oxidation and degradation of fine art materials. So it can cause darkening of papers. It can cause acid, um, develop, development of acids in some lower quality textiles and lower quality paper as well. Conversely, it will actually fade um, fugitive pigments. And so I'm thinking of your natural dyes or your, or your organic dyed materials. These are things that, um, as opposed to your inorganic pigments, where you literally have a stone that is crushed down to a fine powder and bound by that adhesive, those tend to be pretty um, uh, light fast is the term that's used in the fine art field. 
Um, again, we might not know exactly what a painting's pigments were. Um, if they were made out of all of those inorganics, it might be fine in the sunlight. Um, but the other thing to think about is when things are in direct sunlight, the environment changes quite drastically. Your temperature is going to raise. And in relation to that, the relative humidity is going to change as well. Your organic materials might flex, expand, or contract um, in response to that changing environment. Um, so I understand and I sympathize with the desire to look at your, to see your artwork well. Um, but those considerations need to be taken into, into, into play. So you could essentially put your painting behind glazing or behind a UV filtered glass to protect it. Um, but still, you're still going to get some visible light, which can actually cause some change, even though it might be protected by UV. And that's something I didn't even address in the early on, that UV will also, the UV that's in sunlight will actually catalyze that deterioration as well and cause darkening of varnishes too. So, okay, so then are you oh. basically saying, no, I, I mean, this is all, I'm just thinking about it. If I am looking around my home and mm. I have some like important paintings for me, I mean, honestly for it, it is like, what do you really want to value? And that's different than the monetary value. Are you saying that as tempting as it is to put it as close to a yeah. window as possible, it's not yeah. a good idea. No, it's not, it's not advised at all. Don't put it in direct sunlight if you, if you have no choice. Northern light is actually pretty good. It's, it tends to be very filtered. You're reflecting off of the atmosphere as well. Um, so it's gonna be safer than say something that's in Southern exposure, you know, where we are in the Northern hemisphere, of course, that your Southern exposure is gonna be more direct and is gonna have a more deleterious effect. Great, okay. Um, so a few other mm -hmm. questions I'm seeing some multiples on is, oh, one thing, a couple just clarifications yeah. is going back to the dustings, yeah. or just to clarify, can you dust paintings both with and without glass or as you called it, glazing? Yeah, you can. Um, so when it, something's behind glazing, so we can talk about glazing more um, or behind glass you know, the dust isn't necessarily going to be on the painted surface. It will be the glass itself and you can dust that. There you also want to keep in mind your frame because the glazing will probably be held in place by the frame um, and you can dust both. Um, I actually have a little jar of brushes that are behind me. And so I have some that are labeled just for the frame and just for the painted surface because your frames are gonna have more exposed surfaces and those are going to get dustier. So you can dust the frame with one and dust the painting with the other. And then after your dusting session, wash all of your brushes thoroughly for the next season. Yes, okay. And people did ask about that for washing brushes mm -hmm. that just soap and water, like a- You know, actually, so you, you uh, mentioned a great soap in the Cleaning Outdoor oh, yeah. Sculpture. It's uh, one of the major soaps. Dawn dish detergent is really fantastic. You need one tiny little drop in, um, a mixing bowl full of water and you can clean your brushes in that way. As opposed to pouring your soap into the bristles directly, you could leave soap residue behind. So I would create yourself a little frothy water bath and, and swirl your brushes in that and then rinse them thoroughly as well. Okay, and another question that people wanna know more about is you mentioned the color checker and not everyone's oh, yes. familiar with like what you, so you take it at the beginning, but can you just explain why it's a valuable tool yeah. for, I know both conservators, but also maybe at home as well. Absolutely. So color checkers allow you to balance the light. So um, the light that I have actually behind the computer right now, I have a blend of cool and warm lighting um, to create an even light throughout and doesn't, it keeps things from washing out. So um, here you've got pure grays as opposed to, um, if I only had warm lights in here, the whites would actually tend to look a little bit more yellow. And what this does is it allows you to compare whatever else is in that photograph when this is balanced correctly. So each of these grays have a specific numerical RGB value when it is put into a photo processing software. And you don't necessarily have to do this on your own. It's useful if you are taking this to a professional who regularly treats their, these types of objects to understand how that artifact might have changed over time. 
And so within the museum, when we're doing treatment, when we're doing the documentation, we always have a color checker because it might be years or decades in between the time an artwork is on display or treated. And so we want to compare what it looked like earlier and then as well before and after treatment. So you can see how well did the visible appearance of the artwork improve after it was cleaned. So that's the purpose of a color checker. Um, so what you're saying is it's slightly more advanced. So if you're yeah. if you are going to take this after and do what yeah. Gwen says and get a notebook and start cataloging every <laughs> time you dust, then this might be a really good next step. It might not be for everyone. No, no, not at all. I'm thinking about like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking artists who are considering, you know, they're, they're painting dozens of paintings and they're trying out different pigments and, you know, even, even Turner at one point, he was approached by an owner of, you know, some of his paintings that he had made who had complained about the fact that his pigments had actually faded within a couple of years of him purchasing it. And Turner's response was something along the lines of, well, that's not my problem. You purchased the artwork that I had painted. I wasn't guaranteeing that it would stay the same forever. I think, I think that's a great clarification with it. And I think yeah. it is a really cool tool. I love seeing it when you're looking at treatments and you see like the before and after, I really feel like the color checker, you can see how important of a tool it is. Yeah. Um, and someone just asked, it's not, they said, is the color checker electronic? It's always no. an in-person physical because no. you have to see it in the context, right? Yeah. And again, um, so be very careful when you hand this, you want to have clean hands. You do not want to touch the, um, the colors themselves because the oils in your hand, just like on artwork, um, can actually start to stain and degrade um, this. So it's in a little protective sleeve and it is kept in the dark when it is not being actively used for photography. Okay, I, this is just a, a little bit separate, but I yeah. love this question. So I got to switch <laughs> to it. Um, someone asked what cleaning methods and i'm gonna broaden up okay not just cleaning methods but what things should you not do at home that you oh. have heard about <laughs> there's so many i know <laughs> there's so many there's there's the you know spraying the back of the canvas with a water bottle there's cleaning a cleaning a painting with breadcrumbs there's cleaning a paint, painting with um a half a potato or trying to bleach darkened varnish with the half of a lemon. There are so many things that can go wrong, especially when we don't know what those materials are. We don't know what kind of life or what kind of restoration materials are actually on the surface of that painting. So, you know, you can be rubbing with that potato until, until the cows come home and there might not be a change at all. You know, essentially what that potato is doing is it's absorbing dirt. It's that that moisture that's in there is cleaning some of that aqueous grime, but it's also leaving starches behind on the surface of that painting. Um, so, you know, don't put a painting in a tub and hose it down. Don't use Windex on a painting. I have seen many paintings that have been heavily damaged and chemically abraded because Windex is ammonia. You have something that is incredibly alkaline. You're basically going to saponify your oil paint itself. Save it, save it for the windows, basically. Yeah. Save, uh. <laughs> definitely. So, so there are so many don'ts. Um, and and I, I really don't like saying no to people until it comes to things that they care heavily about. I mean, um, there is a lot of irreparable damage that can occur. Yeah, so I mean, if it's at that point where it's more than just a dusting, that is when you really should go to a professional or at least get an, a consultation from a yes. professional and they'll advise you because maybe it's best to just leave it alone and not do an interventive treatment, right? So just best to, to ask before, before acting. Yeah, many conservators offer complimentary consultations. You take your artwork to them and they can tell you, you know, whether or not it's in good condition and if it needs treatment and if this is within their scope. Um, the tricky part comes into, you know, when they're trying to provide estimates, um, it is, it's impossible to provide an accurate estimate for the cost of treatment over the phone or through email because a conservator will want to test, you know, how soluble is that surface grime, you know, is it the effective way to treat it, you know, what is the varnish, is the varnish supposed to be removed, will that actually improve the appearance, so you, you know, almost all the time, a conservator is going to actually need to have access and to test that artwork in order to provide estimates. But, you know, 
often looking at the artwork in person can tell you whether or not it's in good condition and if it needs treatment. Okay, so this question comes from the artist side, but yes. on the flip side, Gwen, several other people have asked it as a home collector. So yes. the question from the artist is, what do you recommend for painters to do in order for their paintings to last longer and not become cracked? Thinking about oil and acrylic. And on the flip yeah. side, several people have said that they have had paintings at home, particularly ones that had been rolled and are mm. now cracked. Yeah. So um, from the get-go as a, as a, you know, if a practicing artist, in order to get their finished composition, they'll often be modifying that paint, you know, thinning it out with spirits um, or adding oil to it to increase the gloss or thin out the color and blending the colors together. Um, I think from the get-go, high quality materials um, is incredibly important. And you want to have an understanding of how these materials often age as well. So something like your newsprint that you use for your sketching. Um, and, you know, I have a, I have a bunch of, uh, I still have a bunch of those newsprint um, still like, or um, life drawing um, make things that I've made. And that paper has heavily yellowed because it is not a good quality. Um, if I was more confident, then I might have used cotton rag paper, which is going to age well, um, because it doesn't have that lignin content in it that will cause that type of deterioration. Similarly, your canvases, it's, it will last longer to paint on linen than it is on jute. But I know that there is a significant cost difference in those materials. Um, and it might be as well that you prefer to do highly detailed fine work. And so it might be better for you to work on a solid support. And so looking at, you know, it will be better to paint on blue board than it is on cardboard. Again, you've got an acid content. And there are a number of um, solid supports that you can get at the fine art supply store. Or perhaps you make your own, you know, you get some wood and you, um, prepare it with layers of gesso and then start painting. Um, understanding how these materials react to temperature and relative humidity is going to be key to prevent things like cracking. Um, conversely, if an artist is painting, you know, not in that fat over lean, so that was something that was always traditionally taught, fat over lean, you want to have the most oil content layers on top because those are going to take longer to dry. Um, as opposed to uh, something that is thinned out with spirits. And you have two different mechanisms of drying. And so this is where um, I really get Laura excited is when I talk about the chemical differences in all of these different materials. Um, so, you know, there's a reason why many paintings from the 14th through the 19th century um, last. And it's because you had a very traditional academic approach to painting that, that did age well. And the trouble comes into play when sort of the academic studio went by the wayside and people were becoming self-taught um, and they're using all of this non-traditional material in their paint layers, things like bitumen and waxes and lanolin. Um, those don't necessarily dry and um, create films in the same manner as your linen, um, sorry, your linseed oil, which is a traditional type of um, pigment binder. So, Using the good, the best quality materials that you can afford is going to be the best thing you can do as a practicing artist. Now, on the obverse side, if you have something, you know, uh, I would never recommend you, not never, you know, sometimes you have to roll a painting, um, but understanding, you know, what is going to happen to that paint film. So we do roll paintings. It is, it's something that's quite, you have to roll a painting that is 20 feet long in order to get it moved safely domestically or internationally. Um, unless of course you are going to rent an entire freighter plane to move it. Um, so in rolling, it needs to be really wide rolls which are going to compensate for the mechanical damage that's going to occur to that paint film. Because as a paint film, it, you know, it's quite supple and pliant and it will flex and it will stretch when it's young. And then as it ages, it actually becomes a brittle solid material. And it's only through the manipulation of that film through heat and relative humidity that you can actually regain that elasticity of the film. Um, so 
something that has that, so that's, been yeah, yeah that sounds like a, just because a couple of questions <laughs> with it home. have said will have said um can you fix it at home ah uh, don't, don't fix it at no, home no. go to a professional <laughs> with it you, you have to play with the humidity and that it, yeah but maybe you could talk a little bit with it then if you do notice a painting at home that's starting to crack like yeah. are there ways to mitigate it from getting worse yeah definitely and so that i'm so glad you said mitigate because that's the thing you know a paint film is actually it is a solid film and a crack is a permanent scission in that film layer and that is going to have some effects on the painting as it, it you know going forward it can start being a point where it lifts and it flakes away and so a conservator will need to go in and do that consolidation and remediate or mitigate that appearance but a crack a crack can be visibly conserved so it does it's not it's so, sorry it can be treated so it's not visible but it's still there all we do is we mask it so it's not going to be visibly disturbing um so uh, it's it's just like um it's just like if you were to break glass you know a con objects conservator can repair the glass so it's not quite as visible but that break will always be there interesting yeah that's a that's a a neat comparison because yeah. it does make sense with the breaks like that. So yeah. um, in the mind of with that mitigation, uh, several other questions have come up with a term that might not everyone be uh, familiar with uh, foxing. So could you break down what foxing is? And if again, some people are starting to notice it. So what they can do yeah. to mitigate more. So, okay, foxing actually happens um, most often in paper. And so a paper conservator will be able to tell you a bit more po about foxing. And if um, the knowledge I got in grad school, which is now um, nearly a decade old. You, you don't have correct. to say from when. <laughs> okay. Foxing is essentially the appearance of um, yellowish, um, yellow to brown stains that occur in paper and they can appear spontaneously. And so it looks almost as if you were to drop, you know, um, spots of water on that piece of paper. But, you know, this happens, this happens randomly um, and not necessarily anything that you have done. No, there is acid migration that will occur and discolor paper, um, but I'm going to leave that for our paper conservator. Well, to talk I'm wondering about. if people yeah. are perhaps confusing that with, like, could mole collect on a painting, yes. and that maybe maybe that it's just like a not being able to identify what it is. Exactly. So then yeah. What would you do if you spot mole? Yeah. Oh goodness. Well, okay. So this is a good thing to mention too for all practicing artists and homeowners who are dusting their work, think about your personal safety. You know, if you are sensitive to dust, you will want to wear a dust mask. Um, if you are an artist who's practicing and using mineral spirits, you um, should have proper ventilation. When it comes to mold, um, many of us are sensitive to mold. And so your, your PPE, you be them um, eyewear or um, a mask, and we should all have masks at this point, um, will have provide some um, protection against that. You can remediate mold. Mold is an organic living object and it needs to be deactivated and then remediated um, or removed. And so you can kill mold with a variety of methods. And the best method to, to advise is going to depend on the material that that mold is actually growing on. Um, a very passive way of dealing with mold is actually exposing it to UV light. And so um, direct sunlight can actually help short bursts, bursts of direct sunlight can help kill mold. And then you can actually remove it um, with something like a HEPA vacuum. Oh my, sounds yeah, complicated. Yeah, so lots of yeah. spots. And then, so you can you can have things that, you know, get flung on your, flung on your painting. So if you have a painting on display in your dining room and some, you have an exuberant guest who's like, demonstrating with their wine don't glass, invite them wine back stuff. right don't then they're they're cut off they're <laughs> yeah um or you know flies that can land on the surface of the paint layer and they you know fly specks is actually an actual term that we use in conservation these are little dark spots that are actually secreted from the fly and they're quite acidic and they can actually stain a paint layer or etch varnish layers as well um so you have a whole range of spots and discolorations that can occur to your artist artist materials um, or sorry your fine art well so you mentioned the fly spots um people have been asking about tiny insect holes on oh, yeah so you know we have 
all of our pests in the world that like to eat these things because you know canvas wood protein based um size layers these this is all food for pests and you know where and especially if you have a painting on display you know where you have cooking um residues or food um it's going to attract them more regularly and so if you have fine art storage do and um i don't have one on me um you know, we have glue traps um, where you can actually order glue traps and have them on display. Um, after, if ever it's been eaten by a pest, I mean, that's gone. Um, a, a conservator can actually remediate the appearance of those holes. It's, it's quite, so, you know, it's, it may be treated in a very similar way as if somebody were to go up and actually poke a hole through something. Um, the best thing to do about pests, honestly, is just to prevent them from getting there. So you think about where your artwork is and you think about the activities that are happening in the spaces where artwork is on display or stored. Which is why okay. food, yeah. are, food is not allowed in the galleries specifically for this reason. So again, be very mindful where your art, what, what artwork you choose in the places that you eat, right? Yeah, I mean, that. That old adage, an ounce of prevent prevention is worth a pound of cure. It is so much easier to prevent damage than it is to repair it. Because quite often, you know, a repair can be made not visible to the eye, but all of our materials that we put on an artwork to, to restore its condition, that ages and it deteriorates as well. You know, ideally we're using, you know, yes, conservators are using excellent materials that have shown and tested to be stable and can last decades. But that, that, that period of aging is different from the original materials. And so our materials will become visibly apparent in four to six decades sometimes, if it's in a good environment. If you're putting it in an area of direct sunlight and you're not protecting it from the environment, our materials might age much more quickly than that. So it's again, getting the return on your investment with it. Exactly. Um, we do only have a couple minutes left, but wow. one more, I know it goes by so quickly. <laughs> um, another couple questions that people have them lumping together is questions yeah. about varnish. And again, not everyone might be super yeah. familiar with it. So yeah. could you briefly explain what that is? And then um, maybe thinking about what that might look like in your home and caring for different varnishes? I had just the right prop for this too. It's an old river washed oyster shell. So um, the role of a varnish in um, is essentially to saturate the layer and it does provide some protection, but that wasn't originally why it was um, applied. So, you know, I have a little thing here. Um, so this painting has not been varnished yet. And so you can see the variation in surface glass. Um, what a varnish will do with this oyster shell, for instance, it's just like when you pull a river rock out. So it saturates that. So you can see those colors that were that were originally there. You know, it brings out these details and the, the values of an artwork. Um, not every artwork needs to be varnished. I'm going to highlight one of your favorite artists, Alma Thomas. Her paintings weren't necessarily meant to be varnished and they wouldn't be visually improved necessarily by varnishing either. Um, it comes down to how that those original materials age. So varnishes are different from paints um, chemically, and um, we exploit that as conservators. Um, varnishes will dry by evaporation, and they can be resolubilized with specific um, with targeted solvents. Um, you can get um, a variety of varnishes at the art supply store, um, be they solid resinous form that you then you saw um you put into solution yourself you can even get some that is um already dissolved even in a spray can that you can put um some of those might be the same original resins that are used by conservators but they might might have been modified so for instance this one is considered a matte varnish and it has wax in there to make it matte you know, um, but we don't know the concentration. We don't know the solvents and, or how that's going to age. So a conservator will often make their own varnish and apply it either by brush or by spray. Um, and again, we're trying to use things that age really, really well. Um, and it's going to buy a significant shelf life or display life for that object. All right, but, so yes. Oh, sorry. Um, but the thing that we exploit too is we want to know the solubility of these things. So I know what those varnishes are soluble on are soluble in, 
the concern comes if I need to use a specific solvent to dissolve that varnish, is it going to dissolve the painting underneath as well? So again, acrylics, these are very soluble, sensitive um, films. So, I mean, look, it sounds <laughs> like, to be honest, you could teach a master class on varnishes alone. So I, there's a lot more to dig into. I feel mm -hmm. like we, maybe if there's good feedback for it, maybe we do a continuation because there, I wish I could have got into all of these questions. <laughs> They're amazing. So, you know, I did put in here uh, a bunch of links right now, so you can click on them. We have the feedback form. And if you have a follow-up question, we included the email. So um, we can try and get back with you on it. Cause again, you guys had just so many questions this round. Uh, yes. We also have registration open for our next Converse with a Conservator. That's on February 3rd. And I also put in a links for our online calendar as well as where the recording for this program and our past programs live. So Gwen, thank you so much for, this was super illuminating <laughs> and you definitely you. put me to shame in my home. I know <laughs> the thing is it's the basics, right? You don't not, you're not all gonna walk away with being conservative, but hopefully you got some really good tips and tricks um, for things that you can do at home. I mean, there's a reason why you get a master's degree to become a conservator in the United States. There's there's a lot to think about here. Um, but thank you. This, is, yes, this has been so much fun. Gwen, the main takeaways are don't try this at home, but also prevent. Prevention, prevention, prevention. And there's always yes. professionals. Should it be past the point of prevention? Yes, there's there's many resources online about you know how to provide preventive care for your collection. So we're not reinventing the wheel here for you in that. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Gwen. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good evening.